Okay. Hi friends. How are you? I'm excited to be talking about this. I love these creatures. Um, you've probably never heard of them, even even in this class, because we never look at them. Have any of you heard of this file before you read that paper? Um, so they're ubiquitous. They're one of the older uh, fungal phyla, right? So we can look at this phylogenetic tree. Um, so when we were in the field, all of the mushrooms that you saw fell into these two phyla, right? And most of them were Basidium mycops. Um, so we're going to be today focusing on this phylum here, the Glomera mycota. If you want a little bit more context, uh, there's actually more phyla than this, but, but this was the best image I can get. There's a number of like basal fungal phyla that we don't really know the best phylogenetic relationships between them, um, and then animals are our outgroup here. Um, so we're going to look at Glomera mycota, and they're really, really interesting um, to me because they they represent like a kind of multicellularity that is pretty distinctive. Like it doesn't it doesn't take the same patterns and forms that you see in the higher fungi or in animals. They're they're a much more communal organism than basically any other kind of organism, and I think that's really really cool. Uh, and um, yeah, so what is it? I, the, all of the text in this slideshow is just quotes from that paper, um, so I'm not going to read it, but I did pull them out, right? So it's a monophyletic group of soil borne fungi. They're important because they form intimate associations with plants and they're uh, crucial for the colonization of land, right? So those are some pretty big features. So they're symbiotic, um, they're mycorrhizal, so they live in the soil, they make partnerships with plants, and they make soil. Um, and for those reasons, they're really super important. Um, a little personal context, I live on a commune. We run a farm. Uh, it's a no-till farm. How many of you have heard of no-till agriculture before? Some of you. Um, so a lot of the research into glomerular mycota is associated with no-till agriculture because no-till pays more attention to soil biota than, than other forms of agriculture does. And my commune's name is Glomus because we're nerds. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. It's not just that we run a farm. There's like particular life history patterns that Glomer and Mycotta exhibit that um, I find very inspiring. And so we've, we're just a bunch of nerds. That's, that's really all it is. <laughs> okay. Um, so... The most distinctive feature of glomerular mycota is that they enter into our muscular mycorrhizal symbioses with their plant hosts, where they exchange nutrients. Um, so this is a schematic diagram, right? So you can see the fungus comes from outside and it will move through the intercellular space in the plant root. And then at some point when, um, for whatever reasons that we don't yet know, um, the, the fungus reaches a cell that it wants to partner with, it will form this, this tree structure inside the cell. Uh, and they're really, really beautiful. <laughs> like they're, they're astonishingly beautiful. Um, so there's two types, but to me, this is an example of maybe scientists over-categorizing things. Like there's two types in that. One looks like this. You've got a single tree that sort of fills up the cell. And the other, and so this is called the arum type, right? Arum like, um, I don't know why it's called arum. Um, and then this is the Paris type, where you see you've got um, multiple trees or little bushes inside inside the single cell. Right, so this is like, if you're looking for information about this stuff, you'll find these two categories, but they're a little bit fallacious, right? And that's what this quote here says, right? An inherent issue in defining mycorrhizal structures as being either arum or Paris morphological types is the fact that some mycorrhizal fungi can produce both, um, depending on the environment. And the studies suggest that characterizing either as RM or Paris type is as the primitive condition, right, as the evolutionarily um, more basal condition is, is fraught, um, because we know almost nothing about how these structures evolved. Um, and that's going to be a theme <laughs> throughout this talk. Um, because these are soil microorganisms, they live underground, they're tiny, they're easy to overlook, and they're just understudied. Um, so there's quite a lot that we don't know. Um, the entire field of mycology is like that, right? Like, you were out in the field and you were trying to get the names of these things, and I'm sure you encountered, like, oh, well, it used to be called this, and now it's called this. Like, um, mycology, more than the other life sciences, is really, there's many more unknown questions and many more, like, pretty basic things that we should know or think we should know, but we just don't. So it's possible that there's some phylogenetic significance to these two types of mycorrhizae. And it's also possible that it's just like 
We were looking at our microscopes. We saw some shapes, and we gave them names, but they have no phylogenetic importance whatsoever. Um, who knows? Uh, so this isn't actually a photograph, right? And it's fuzzy because microscopy is hard, but it's a little bush living inside of a cell. Uh, and yeah, it's just, it's just astonishingly beautiful. That's, I'm just going to say that over and over because I want to convince you of it because it's true. <laughs> um, cool. So arbuscles are developed upon penetration of cortical cells via invagination of the plasma membrane. So what that means is that the typhal thread will come into the cell in, in, in this trunk, right? And then invagination is a very evocative word, but basically what it means is you can imagine two cell membranes. You've got the cell membrane of the hypha, and you've got the cell membrane of the plant. And the hypha sort of pushes in, and the plant folds away. Um, and so they form this double membrane structure, this double membrane tree structure. So there's actually two trees here, which is why it's sort of difficult to resolve. There's one tree that's made of the hyphal membranes, and then there's another inverse negative tree that's made of the plant cell membranes. And in between those two trees, there'll be transport proteins that emerge that allow nutrients to pass back and forth between them. Um, so they're incredibly intricate structures. It's like the, the most close hug you could possibly imagine, like two cells fusing. It, it, it's meant to optimize surface area. Right? So you have this fractal branching tree, so you get as much surface area for a limited volume occupied as you can. Um, cool. So I made a video about that where I can be more articulate and less out of breath. Uh, and you can see my face. So we're going to watch that video. Um, this beautiful tree yeah. above me is smaller than a single cell. It's called an arbuscle, little tree arbor, and it's formed through a process called invagination, which is basically exactly what it sounds like. A hyphal strand from a globus fungus rubs up against the cell membrane of its plant host and begins to push it inside itself. The cell membrane of the plant envelops the membrane of the fungus and a tree begins to grow. With each branching of membrane upon membrane, contact space opens up for communication and exchange between fungus and plant, and channels form between the membranes and fluids flow. <laughs> this association is intimate. The bodies of both the fungus and the plant are changed at a cellular level. The boundary between what is inside one and outside the other grows blurry, and both become a fused branching tree. An arbuscle. Uh, so boundaries become blurry. That's going to be a theme, right? Like Glomer Mycota, they're really, really good at basically not caring about organismal interiority, right? Like we have this very deep sense of like, I'm me and like, I got my skin, I walked through the world, like I don't like it when insects put their little proboscide into my skin and itches, right? Like, um, but Glomer Mycota, because of their evolutionary history and the ecological niches that they occupy, they just don't, like everything about them uh, just doesn't, doesn't keep track of that kind of organismal integrity. Um, and so we'll, we'll see another, a bunch of different points about this yeah. 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 as we move on. Um, but they're not, they're not coherent creatures. So in this first example, what we see is that like, in order for them to get the calories that they need, in order for them to live in their ecological niche, they literally have to fuse with plants um, in this very, very detailed way. Um, and there's other fusions we'll look at next. Um, okay. Cool. So, there is compelling evidence that the presence of arbuscal mycorrhizae strongly influences many plant community factors because fungi can colonize multiple plants, forming a common mycorrhizal network. Um, they can form hyphal anastomoses between different species. So, this is a little gif that I made of anastomosis. Have you heard that word before? Anyone heard that word before? It's like my favorite word. Um, anastomosis is the fusion of branches, right? So, if you think about, say, uh, a phylogeny, a tree that you've seen. Uh, the patterns of speciation are typically that you have one species and then there's some sort of selective pressure and it branches into two, right? So that's ramifying would be the, the, the scientific word for when a, or when a branch branches, it ramifies. You can do the opposite, right? Branches can fuse back together and that's called anastomosis. So you can see we've got one hyphal branch, we've got another hyphal branch, 
and then they fuse. Well, now it's going in reverse, but there, they fuse. <laughs> um, so anastomosis is a very important abstract concept. It applies far beyond mycology. Um, you see anastomosis in your blood vessels and on phylogenetic trees. Sometimes different species will fuse back together, like with humans and Neanderthals. So Neander um, anastomosis is a very critical pattern that you see in evolutionary history, uh, but it's often overlooked because um, we usually look at speciation and differentiation and things like that. But glomer might kind of like to fuse. So um, you might have heard like sort of the pop sci term of the, the wood wide web, right? This idea that trees can communicate with one another and exchange nutrients through these mycorrhizal networks. Well, those networks are made almost entirely. I mean, there, there are basidial mycota and ascomycota that are doing this, but glomer mycota are like the basis of it. And they're certainly the oldest lineage of fungi that do this. Um, so glomer mycota are obligate mutualists. They, in order to exist, they have to find a plant partner. Um, and they're also pretty gregarious or promiscuous, right? So they will fuse with a number of different species of plants, and that allows those plants to interact. So you can get oaks interacting with pines because they're both partnered with the same organism. Um, yeah, I should breathe more. <laughs> um, so it's generally believed the biodiversity of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi is far greater than presently understood, because how would we know? Um, and some of the problems of identification relate to the absence of sufficiently large morphological characters, the potential for dimorphic spores, and I'll get back to that in a moment, um, and the difficulty discovering the life history of biology. So I included this image here. It's super blurry, um, even on the screen if it wasn't in a, in a PowerPoint presentation, it would be very blurry. Um, you can make out a few things. This is a plant root. These are what's called gigaspores. Um, and that term dimorphic, two-formed, it means that Spores from the same species can be radically different in size, um, and more importantly, in genetic composition. Um, and if the spores can vary a lot in genetic composition, it's very difficult for scientists to identify a species correctly, even identify a single organism correctly, um, because they don't have the same kind of genetic continuity that other organisms have, and we'll be exploring that more. Um, and they're just also, they're small, right? So there's these hyphal threads here that are super microscopic. These gig spores are huge. And each of these will contain hundreds of nuclei, but they're still, they're still microscopic, right? Um, so they're just hard to study. Um, okay, so gigaspores. These are, well, actually, this is the best definition of glomer mycota in that paper. There's sort of like three morphological features. Glomer mycota fungi are characterized by co enocytidic, aseptate, or sparsely septate hyphae. I'll, get, I'll explain that. Large, multinucleated spores, gigaspores, and highly branched structures termed arbuscles. So we can dwell on that sentence for a little bit, because those are three features that are worth paying attention to. So we already went over the first one, right? So the arbuscles are, well, let's do a little review. What's an arbuscle? Someone who's brave. <laughs> I just told you. Yes. Like the hyphae that goes inside the plant cell and creates mm -hmm. that like connection. Yes. Right. So hyphae that goes inside the plant cell makes a connection. That's a branch structure called an arbuscle. So now we can look at these two morphological features. So co-enocytidic aseptic hyphae. Right? So what this means is that the hyphal threads contain cells. There's many cells, but the cells are not divided by cell walls or cell membranes even. So instead, you've got this vast hyphal network, and it's full of thousands or millions of nuclei that sort of give a genetic identity to the cell, but they're just hanging out there in a, in a big conglomeration, right? The, the word glomus comes from the Greek glob, just means like a pile. Um, so you can almost think of glomeromycota as a unicellular creature. You can't, like they're clearly multicellular, but they, they're one giant cell. Um, so that's what that means, aseptic, right? So they've got, they share uh, cytoplasm between the entire network, and nuclei are free to migrate through the network as they keep. Um, and then you see the same thing with the reproductive structures. So here are their spores, um, and large multinucleated spores. So each spore will contain multiple nuclei, which is basically unprecedented. Have you heard of any other organism that has multiple nuclei in its, in its gametes? No. Maybe they exist, but I don't know of any others. <laughs> um, so it's, it's weird that they, these are their reproductive structures, so they'll send their spores out to do what spores do, 
Um, but the spores are not genetically identical. They're not unitary. Instead, they contain a community of different nuclei. Um, oh, and I made another video about that. So let's watch that. Glomeromycota are a phylum of fungi characterized by aseptic hyphae and multinucleated spores. And this is really weird. Let's unpack that. We're talking about a multicellular creature with no divisions, no septa between its cells. And likewise, glomeromycotan spores are often called gigaspores because they're so big and they have so many nuclei packed into a single spore cell. All these features mean that unlike every single eukaryotic organism on the planet, glomeromycota do not have a single cell bottleneck in them life cycle. There's no point in their life history where their genetic identity is restricted down to a single nucleus. And this is a really big deal. There's this long-held biological dogma which says that in order for high levels of cooperation to evolve levels high enough to produce complex, multicellular bodies, you need to have genetic homogeneity. All of the genes in all of the cells need to be identical in order to make sure that their reproductive interests remain aligned. If the genes in my sperm, for example, grow sufficiently different from the genes in my eyes, then my eyes might stop cooperating with my sperm to get their selfish sperm genes out of my body and into the body of my child. Oh. So, in order for multicellular cooperation to evolve, the theory says, all of the genes need to have an equal chance of making it into the next generation. But in glomeromycota, this is simply not the case. There's a huge amount of genetic diversity among the nuclei of the hyphal network, and in fact, some networks are so promiscuous, promiscuous here being a technical, biological term, some networks are so promiscuous that they will fuse with other hyphal networks of different species. And there's no separation between the cells in these networks, right? So nuclei will just get shuffled around and globbed together into these gigaspores, even though they are very different from one another genetically. Because of this, it might be better to think of glomeromycota not as single fungal organisms, but rather as a community of organisms living all together inside the same branching body. Because of the way that they grow, fusing with plant cells, budding off gigaspores at any point in the network, glomeromycota do not need homogeneity in order to cooperate complexly. For these creatures, the boundary between self and other will always be a blurry one, and I find that strangely comforting. Who wants to be the same self all the time? You know? I find... Um, so... That's getting into a bit of evolutionary biology that's a little bit outside the scope of this class, but it's what I used to study, so I pay attention to it. But basically, um, there's a big mystery around the evolution of multicellularity, right? Like I showed you that phylogeny at the very beginning, that here are the multicellular groups of fungi, and they had to evolve from single-celled ancestors. And, and we also, all the metazoans, also had to evolve from single-celled ancestors. And there's a puzzle about how you get the kinds of cooperation required to make that happen, because it's basically a kind of sacrifice. All of the cells in your body, except your gametes, are never going to make it out of your body, right? Their reproductive interests are basically at a dead end. Um, and so the only way that your body can coherently be a body is because your, your, all of the cells in it are genetically identical to one another. So if you can get your gametes into the next generation, then all of the other cells win. That's, that's a bit crude, but that's, that's basically the, the, the way the evolutionary logic holds. Um, so as part of that, there's, there's this idea that has emerged over the last 50 years or so that basically says that in order to be a multicellular creature, you have to start from a single cell bottleneck. Right? There has to be, at the very beginning, one cell in order to guarantee that all of the other cells that come from it are the same. They are identical so that they can cooperate with one another. And you see this at multiple levels. You also see it in hymenopterans, right? In, in the eusocial insects, you've got a queen that produces a bunch of progeny. And those progeny are sufficiently related to one another to give up their reproductive interests for the benefit of the hive. The hive. So this is a, a pattern or a theme that we see across the tree of life, um, but we don't see it in glomeromycota. <laughs> it's very, very strange. Um, so glomeromycota don't have a single cell bottleneck. Instead, they've got a community of nuclei that are quite diverse, right? There's a lot of variation between the nuclei. And when it comes time for the network to reproduce, to produce spores, instead of producing a single genetically homogeneous spore, homogeneous spore, multiple nuclei will migrate into that spore and then sort of maintaining the community diversity of the multicellular organism. So you would expect that there would be all sorts of evolutionary complications with this, you get cheating, right, like some nuclei would evolve genes that would bias their presence in the spores over others. Um, that may be the case, it's understudied. It's certainly the case in other 
proto multicellular organisms that we know of. Like, how many of you have heard, heard of Dictyostilium? It's a kind. It's the best studied slime molds. Like when we were in the forest, we saw these slime molds, and many of you asked me, like, "Hey, does this count as a species that I can find?" I was like, "Well, no, they're not strictly speaking multicellular. Like slime molds are this weird thing where they're unicellular at a point, and then they come together during their sexual stage." Um, and there's often a lot of conflict in that sexual stage about like who gets to make it into the next generation and who just becomes a stock or like some, some sort of supporting feature in the fruiting body that doesn't actually move on, evolutionarily speaking. Um, so there may be conflicts like that in Glomer Mycota. I haven't read about them, but you know, it's, it's an understudied group. Um, but in any case, even if those conflicts are there, they're not prevalent enough to prevent a multicellular body from forming. Like it seems like these community dynamics of a body made up of genetically unique nuclei seems to be working for them. It's been working for them for 400 million years. Um, and that's rather mysterious and I think kind of beautiful. Um, so the next few slides are going to elaborate on everything I just said a little bit. That's a lot. So I'm going to say it all again. Ready? <laughs> um, so glomeromycotin spores contain hundreds of nuclei that come from the surrounding mycelium rather than the rest, rather than being the result of the divisions of a single nucleus. So these are all examples of different species, and in some, the microscopy is good enough that you can see what I think are individual nuclei, right? So these little, these little circles inside circles. Um, same thing up here. Right? So these are all gigaspores. They're large, um, contain hundreds of nuclei, and the nuclei are not genetically identical. Um, okay, so some quotes from the paper. There has been no direct evidence of sexual reproduction in the group, and molecular variation suggests that clonal expansion is the basis for ecological success of these fungi. Um, so when you look at the city of Mycota, when you look at the mushrooms, um, those fruiting bodies, their sexual structures, and we know that meiosis occurs inside the gills of an agaric, um, meiosis being sex in, in the technical sense, right? That the, the genes are actually shuffling. Um, so we see no evidence for molecular sex, for meiosis in glomer mycota. The nuclei are never fusing and then dividing. Um, however, many genes commonly linked to sex in a number of groups of fungi across the genome occur in glomer mycotin species. This indicates that glomer mycota, mycota do possess all the machinery necessary for successful meiosis. Um, if you research fungal sex, you will see that phrase in basically every paper. There's a tremendous number of species that we've never seen have sex because it's hard to have sex in a laboratory. Um, but nonetheless, when we do genetic analysis, we find that they do have meiotic genes available. So it's likely that under some set of conditions, meiosis would happen, that the nuclei would fuse and then divide um, according to the way that you learned in ninth grade biology or whatever. Um, but it's very rare, and it seems to be the case that glomer mycota maintain genetic diversity using other means. They don't rely on sex very much at all. Um, so what are those other means, right? Um, there was a 2012 paper which demonstrated that a surprising amount of genetic and phenotypic variation occur successively in a single arbuscular mycorrhizal fungal spore through clonal growth. This is an unexpected amount of variation to be defined, to be derived from a clonal organism for which the authors see no other parallels in nature. So I've already said this, right? So we have these gigaspores. They contain lots of different nuclei. And the nuclei are genetically unique enough that they contain levels of genetic variation that resemble a sexually reproducing species, even though there's no sex happening, right? Like by having these communities of nuclei migrate in concert through these spores, they can maintain genetic diversity without doing the particular sex act that um, we typically think of. Um, another study from 2011 concluded that the spores of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi have two origins, those that migrate into the spore and those that arise via mitosis within the spore. So sometimes nuclei enter the spore, and sometimes they divide and replicate themselves perfectly, but there's still diversity within it. And therefore, these spores do not represent a stage in the life cycle with a single nucleus, raising the possibility that our vascular mycorrhizal fungi, unlike all other known eukaryotic organisms, lack the genetic bottleneck of a single nucleus stage. Um, so to me, like I've said this three or four times now, to me this is probably the most profound point, or, or like the most profound feature of this group, that they don't have a single cell bottleneck, right? Which means that 
their identity in, in a very deep sense, in an evolutionary sense, is questionable, right? You can't, you can't pull out a genetic sample from a glomeromycotin network and say, aha, I have the genome of the thing, right? Because their genome is full of variation. It has thousands, millions of redundant nuclei, each of which is a little bit different. Um, and somehow it can maintain high levels of cooperation, even though there are potential conflicts of interest between the individual genomic patterns within the network. Does anyone have any questions about that? I know it's a lot. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah. So they never start with the single nucleus ever? No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So do the nuclei just come from like clonal reproduction? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, so the nuclei will reproduce within the network. I mean, who knows? There's probably some rule about like how many nuclei you need per surface area or per volume because you need to be producing the genes that allow the thing to live. Um, but it's not as clear cut as like each nuclei for each little cell. They just kind of move around and they all contribute. So it gives them a lot of phenotypic plasticity. Like maybe one nucleus won't have the right gene to respond to that particular environmental condition, but another nuclei will. So that one will take up the slack. It's like it's the same thing as heterozygote advantage in, in you or I. Like we're diploid for a reason. Like you've got copies of your genes from your mother and your father. And the idea is that you might have an adaptive gene from one parent that isn't present in the other. But the way that they're expressed and sort of the, the internal dynamics that allow one gene to be expressed over another one are going to be radically different in a body like this than a body like yours, where it's, everything's much more tightly bound. Um, OK. Yeah. Um, so how do you like know if it's like, how do you study one network if, they're, if there's so much different genetic input? You don't? <laughs> I mean, like, how, how do you study it? I don't actually know, right, is, is maybe an honest answer. But like, I'm sure you can go into the soil, you can pull out a hyphae, you can analyze all the different nuclei within it. Um, but where one network ends and another one begins, where one individual ends and another one begins, where one species ends and another one begins, is highly ambiguous. Because they form all of these associations with other plants. Um, yeah. That's, that's actually, it has also been demonstrated that our muscular mycorrhizal fungi are promiscuous and that hyphal connections in the form of hyphal fusion can develop with other members of the population, which may enable further genetic exchange. Um, so they're not limited to fusing with members of their own species. Um, this is true not just for glomer mycota. Um, I read a paper about psilocybes recently that shows that the, the molecules that make psilocybin are found independently in a number of different basidiomyces lineages that are not related, and I believe that's because of horizontal gene transfer. So fungi will fuse, and they'll swap gene parts. It's fairly common, but it's also really weird. <laughs> so again, it's this anastomosis thing, yeah? So can glomeromycota like, fuse and like, join networks with other types of fungi, like other phyla? Um, probably not other phyla. Uh, it's, I don't think we know how closely related or distantly related you need to be in order to be compatible for this kind of fusion, but certainly whatever concept we might want to apply for species, like whatever species concept we're using, to, there, there's 250-ish listed glomeromycotin species, and there's very likely far more than that, or maybe there's far less, depending on how you choose to define species, right, because if they can fuse and change nuclei, then the species concept that you learned from metazoans doesn't really apply here um, because they, they're so readily exchanging different kinds of genetic information. Um, so yeah, I mean, probably they can't fuse with like basidiomycotes. Like, I think that would be really surprising. But certainly across species lines and across genus lines within glomeromycota, they can exchange nuclei um, to, to adaptive effect. We know so little about microbial diversity. There was a paper published a couple years ago where the scientists made a conservative estimate that there's at least a trillion species of microbes globally. Yeah. Based on you know, hundreds of soil samples that were taken across the globe, and you look at the number of taxa that are unique to those soils, and there are statistical tools where you can predict total levels of biodiversity, and it's likely a staggering amount of diversity that you have yet to characterize. Yeah, we, there's so much diversity there, and the concept of a species is like, in some ways, it is not a human construction, right? Like, obviously, Homo sapiens is a unique species. You can't make kids with a bonobo. It wouldn't work. But when you get to, 
living forms that don't resemble us so much, don't resemble animals so much, our intuition about what species means really breaks down. And it's not that it's a useless concept, like you want to be able to point to a thing, but like, you're that thing, and you're the same thing as that thing, and you're different than that other thing. Like, that's what we want to do as scientists, but it becomes more challenging when their life history patterns are just, just going in. Um, so, yeah, there's trillions of unidentified microbial species, but those microbial species, they're dividing mitotically. You can, you can like, try to find a, a monophyletic branch, right? You're like, well, this one, you can see the branching pattern, and they all come from that root, and so we're going to say that's a species because of that. But that breaks down because sometimes you get anastomosis, and so it's, it's really hard to, to actually define this concept in a way that's philosophically consistent across all branches of life. And asexual species can still evolve, right? Yes or no? As we think about sex, meiosis, genetic recombination, that, that creates diversity within populations. Asexual species can also evolve, right? How do we define evolution? There's bio students in this class that should be able to <laughs> define that pretty easily. Chapter one of your textbook. How do we define evolution? Anybody? Ooh. Yeah. The passing down of genes that make an organism most fit for its environment. Yeah, there's parts of the definition in there. Just from a, it's not necessarily about natural selection, right? There are other mechanisms of evolution. So you're describing one mechanism of evolution. Most fundamentally, evolution is just a change in allele frequency in a population over time, right? That's how we define evolution. So how can these types of organisms evolve? How might allele frequencies change over time in this population if they're not having sex? There's no meiosis. So how are mutations happening for these, these nuclei? This multinucleate mass and nuclei are just dividing all over the place, but there's no actual genetic recombination that's happening in creating gametes that then fuse together and create genetically unique individuals from the parents. So how is that genetic variation being generated? I heard one answer. Someone said mutations. Yeah, right. But so how is that happening? This is like back to probably high school biology. Hopefully, Binghamton biology too. I don't know what they're teaching. <laughs> when replication is happening, errors can happen, right? Just like errors can happen during meiosis and recombination can create genetic variability. So every time a nuclei divides, that provides opportunity for mistakes to happen, and that can generate diversity. When we have a really large organism with nuclei that are dividing a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, there's lots of opportunities for mistakes to happen. And the genetic plasticity that's possible with these organisms is just amazing. I think that's some of the most interesting features of this, right? You have all these different nuclei, many of which can make unique gene products, but they're all kind of sharing the same cytosol. Right? The same it's, body. It's really fascinating, which is not how most organisms operate. Sorry, sorry. No, that's great. Uh, <laughs> so is that one of the main ways that this does have genetic variation? Is through that divided mutation? Yeah, like, the word sex means a lot of different things depending on context. Right? And if you ask most biologists, you know, what is sex? They'll say, well, it's meiosis, right? But sex has an evolutionary function that's sort of independent of the mechanism that it happens with. And sex, more vaguely, is, is like shuffling of genes between individuals. So for Glomer and Mikata, we don't see them having sex by fusing nuclei, but instead they fuse cytoplasm networks, right? You can have two individuals that are occupying different portions of the ground, and then their hyphal networks can fuse, and their nuclei can shuffle together. And the nuclei remain distinct, but like the average genetic composition of the network will change because of that interaction. So where, like what locus, at what scale is sex occurring, like I think it would be kind of fair to say that these organisms have sex and that they will swap nuclei around, but it's not meiotic sex, instead it's, it's a different kind of sex, and so the kinds of variations that can emerge from it are different. Should we move on? Okay. Um, okay, so... 
this is a different, we're going to shift gears a little bit. So we've just talked about the identity of Gomer Mycota and how their evolve, uh, evolution is pretty unique. Um, now we're going to talk about history um, and, and ecological impact. So um, this is a fossil. It's found in the Rhiney Church, which is um, a collection of fossils in Scotland dated to about 400 million years old. Um, Glimmer and have been found in the Rhiney Church. Oh, that's just what I said. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, it's really cool. This is a really beautiful example of a data spore. So you can see there's a single spore and there's hundreds of nuclei in there. And each of these has a certain amount of kinetic variation, but they all make the organism. Um, so, 400 million years ago, there were no trees, there were no vascular plants, and in fact, there was no soil. Um, and so it's hypothesized that glomer mycota were really essential, perhaps critical, um, in the population of the land by land plants, because the earliest land plants um, had no substrate to grow in and had no vascular tissue through which to transport nutrients through their multicellular bodies. So again, like when you're thinking about glomer mycota, you have to think about like very early history of life um, before multicellular patterns, patterns had really established themselves. Um, so there was no complicated multicellular plant life or it was just beginning and those plants were then relying on the sort of diffuse cooperative networks that were glomer mycota in order to fulfill multiple life functions. Um, there's a kind of amazing fractal symmetry with this, right? So this is a, an arborescent lycopsid. So you're in the forest and you see these little, they kind of look like mosses, but they're a bit bigger. And they have this little branching pattern. They're hornworts, liverworts, these kind of like primitive plants. Um, there was a time that they were the size of giant trees, right? Here's a little human scale. Um, when we find fossils of these in the Rhiney Church, what we see is that this huge big tree pattern up here is fractally mirrored by this tiny little tree pattern in itself. <laughs> Just like kind of remarkable. All right, so this is a zoom in version of that. It's a little hard to see, but here are the individual plant cells, and here are each of these are arbuscles. Um, so in the earliest fossil plants that we have, we see evidence for glomer mycota being present and in fact um, forming a large portion of their vascular systems. Uh, and that's really cool. Um, so a little bit more on that. Um, the origin and evolution of our muscular mycorrhizal fungi remain controversial. The symbiosis is distinctive in that it's not obligate for the fungus, or it is obligate for the fungus, but it in most cases facultative for the plant. It's widely held that the apparent lack of, or at least poor development of roots in the earliest land plants, in tandem with the scarcity of available mineral nutrients in rudimentary soils, necessitated the evolution of our muscular mycorrhizal symbiosis as a means of colonization of land by plants. Um, so it's two things. One, vascular tissue hadn't evolved, and two, there was no soil. <laughs> it was just like rocky sand. It was dry and, you know, barren. Um, so at the very beginning of the colonization of land by plants, you have this mutualistic association of plants and fungi in order to do what they need to do. Um, and here we have another image of that. So here are plant roots, and here are Glomer mycota hyphae, um, and the hyphae are entering the root, invaginating the cells, forming these beautiful little trees. Um, yeah. And notice how kind of thin the hyphae are relative to the root. Yeah, they're a single cell thick. You can really imagine, again, the benefit when this provides spore plants. They can access pore spaces in the soil environment that are much smaller than roots themselves can access. Um, so it goes a little bit deeper in that the this association didn't just allow those both organisms to thrive, it also changed the environment that they were living in. Um, and so I said at the very beginning of the lecture that glomer mycota are most frequently studied in the context of no-till agriculture. It's because they are very active soil makers, right? So they don't just allow the plant to absorb water and nutrients by like giving it to them, they also impact the environment. Um, have any of you ever heard the term niche construction before? No? Sorry. Um, <laughs> niche construction is this idea that organisms, when they live in their environment, through their activities, they modify their environment. So like beavers, for example, right? Like beavers will chop down trees, they'll make dams, which changes the way the waters flow, which changes what trees can grow, and you get this 
feedback loop where the entire ecosystem changes. Um, humans do this all the time. Um, and this is one of the earliest examples of niche construction, that this partnership between glomer mycota and plants actually structures the composition of soil that they are both living in. Um, specifically, with a compound called glomalin, named for the glomer mycota fungus that produce it. Um, so glomalin is a glycoprotein. Can anyone guess just by the, the structure of that word what glycoprotein is? What is glyco? Yeah? Isn't it like carbohydrate protein? Yes, sugars. And then protein, right? So a glycoprotein is a protein that has sugars attached to it. So glomalin is, is an organic structure um, that's produced abundantly on the hyphae and spores of our muscular mycorrhizal fungi in the soil and roots. Um, and this is a fairly new molecule to us. It was discovered by a USDA researcher named Sarah Wright in 1996. How many of you were born when I, in 1996? Some of you? None of you? <laughs> yeah, I'm old. Um, in any case, you know, we've known about it for 30-ish years, 25 years, um, which is not a very long time. Um, so uh, this is a slide I pulled from the internet. I don't know who to credit for this, but I liked the images, so I put it. But our muscular mycorrhizal fungi invade, invade root cells, transfer nutrients to the plant in exchange for carbon, and they use a portion of that carbon to produce a tough, sticky glycoprotein called glomalin. So these pictures, they're, um, they're fluorescent because the glomalin has been tagged with a fluorescent dye, um, and that should give you some sense of how prevalent it is in the soil. So this is just soil particles, it's dirt, um, and they put this fluorescent dye on it, and you can see that the particles are like completely enmeshed by this glycoprotein. I don't know if you can, like, I can see it because I'm really close, but there's like little threads of it. It's kind of like a glue. Like it's like a spider webby substance that wraps around the soil aggregates and holds them together, keeps them in larger chunks. Um, and here, this is an image of a, a corn plant. You can see there's, these are the gigaspores here. And these are corn roots. And the whole structure is covered in glomalin. So it's covered in this sticky glue. Um, yeah, so it's glomalin that gives the soil its tilt, uh, a subtle texture that enables experienced farmers. This is just a quote, but uh, it's a little obnoxious. But um, enables farmers and gardens to judge great soil by feeling the smooth granules as they flow through their fingers. So you want soil that, that is kind of chunky, right? That, that, has, that has substance to it. You don't want just like sandy stuff that just disintegrates into nothing because that can't hold water, it can't hold nutrients. Um, so, and then, so this is me on my no-till farm, and a four-year study done by Henry Wallace um, found that glomalin levels rose each year after no-till was started. So I've got one more video for you about glomalin. This soil underneath my feet contains an often overlooked protein called glomalin. Glomalin is what gives the soil its rich brown color and allows it to retain the moisture and nutrients that plants need to grow. It's estimated that a third of all of the carbon stored in these soils is bound up in glomalin molecules, and they're incredibly resilient. They can take decades to break down, but we only discovered the molecule in 1996. That means that it's within my lifetime that we've come to understand that the relationship between fungi and plants goes much deeper than nutrient exchange and actually is responsible for creating the physical environment that allows the entire ecosystem to thrive. This so that's glomalin. Um, I'm going to do this a little bit out of order. How you weeds on your notes so far? Uh, a lot of mulch. <laughs> a lot of mulch. Uh, I mean, a number of different things. So mulching, we just do a lot of weeding. Um, we do interplanting, so we plant stuff pretty densely, so that, like, we do a lot of cover cropping, um, and then, you know, so we'll plant rye, and we'll cut down the rye, and then plant immediately into it, so the rye creates its own mulch, so to speak. Um, it's a way to farm. It's very labor-intensive. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe we can... Commercially, most no-till farm involves the application of a ton of herbicide. Mm -hmm. We don't use herbicides. So um, small, small scale operations can get away with that, mm -hmm. but it becomes so labor intensive that on bigger scales you kind of need to spread down a little bit. Yeah, it's. Uh... Maybe we can spend the rest of the class talking about agriculture. I have a lot to say on that. Um, but I just think that this image is, is so striking. Um, so here it says, it requires unusual effort to dis... This is a quote from Sarah Wright. Um, it requires unusual effort to dislodge glomalin for study. 
a bath of citrate combined with heating to 250 degrees Fahrenheit for at least an hour. No other soil groove found to date required anything as drastic <laughs> as this. So, I mean, this is a, an image produced for, for visual effect in a lecture like this. Like, it's actually a little bit more subtle, but here's the soil before extraction. They bathe it in an acid and they heat it up so that they can actually break these compounds. Like, it's a, a very intense procedure. And they pull the guamelin out. So this is this, like, red, sticky protein. And then what's left is sand, basically. Um, so, uh, what does this say? Well, it's the last 7 to 42 years, depending on conditions. I have no idea how they got that number, because we've not been studying guamelin for 42 years. So, you know, question your sources. But this was from a USDA article, so I believe them. Um, so, we've seen guamelin on the outside of the hyphae, and we believe this is how the hyphae seal themselves so that they can carry water and nutrients. It may also be what gives them the rigidity it needs to span the air spaces between the soil particles. So it's really soil glue, right, and it's like this thick, sticky substance, so if you want to maintain moisture, you can wrap everything in it, and it'll keep the moisture in there, prevent it from evaporating, so that it can be more readily taken up by the roots. Um, so this is that same image of corn again. See the glomalin is everywhere. Um, and this USDA study reported that glomalin accounts for 27%, so about a third of all the carbon in the soil. So when we're thinking about climate change, um, carbon sequestration becomes a really important factor. Um, and the majority of carbon in the world is actually stored in soils. And that means that a significant portion of it is stored in this single molecule. And that's pretty cool to think about. Yeah. And, and not only that, but it contributes to carbon storage kind of indirectly too through its effects on soil structure. So when you think about humus, so what is humus again? How do we define humus? Yeah. Isn't it like um, organic matter that's almost completely broken down and it's really nutrient rich? Yeah, yeah, it's or yeah, little teeny bits of organic matter. Um, that are kind of stored long-term in soil environments. And what allows that organic matter to remain stored for long periods of time is that it's protected from full decomposition, which likely means it's protected from free oxygen, which means it's contained within soil aggregates in large part, right? So through the creation of these aggregates, that also protects organic matter that's in the interior of those aggregates from being decomposed fully in the presence of oxygen. So they the glomalin contains carbon itself, obviously, but it's also creating soil structure that promotes storage of humus particles as well. So it's really important for soil carbon storage. So it makes the world we live in, right? So you can imagine 400 million years ago, you, there was nothing on the land, and then the earliest plants, they started to move in, and they needed an environment to live in. And so they partnered with these creatures that didn't just give them the nutrients, but over the course of millions of years of this partnership, they actually created the soil structure that allows the whole thing to exist. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, well, that's it. That's all I have. I, I do want to chat with you for a while, because um, I think this stuff's fascinating. Uh, but that is on my slides. And just, aren't they pretty? Like, look at those gigasports. They're just, they're just astonishing. Um, so please ask questions about farming or fungus sex or anything in between. Yeah. How does the glomalin benefit the glomalin? Uh, like, is it was the intention to make the soil for the plants, or how is it? Um, how does it benefit the whole organism? That's a really interesting question, um, and it it comes from this like deeply functionalist framework that you learned in the school, right? Like that all all. Uh, phenotypic characters have to have adaptive functional significance. And it probably does. Um, in order for us to know like, the full adaptive functional significance of the trait, you have to do experiments where you examine fitness consequences of different things. There's a hypothesis here um, from Wright uh, where she says, um, we see glomalin on hyphae, we believe this is how hyphae seal themselves so that they can carry water and nutrients. So the hypothesis is that the original function of the glomalin is to provide a kind of like water type barrier to allow the hypho network to transport um, whatever it's transporting more efficiently. Um, but there is another functional impact of it which it must be of adaptive significance because basically it works as glue, right? Like you've got this very delicate hyphal network that's moving through the soil. It's super delicate. Like you have a chipmunk running across the soil, it could break the cells, right? Um, so the glomalin 
produces a kind of structure uh, that allows the hyphal network to grow, that, that um, solidifies the soil structure. So they're, they're creating scaffolding for their own bodies. Um, and that's like a, a property of fungi that you see more generally, like not just in glomeromycota, like their bodies are weird. They're a single cell thick, they're distributed across an entire region, like they don't, they don't have the same kind of interiority that we do, where we've got an internal skeleton and an external skin that like keeps everything bound up and rigid. Um, so instead, they secrete these biomolecules outside of their body, but it's like kind of still their body in a, in a certain way. Um, and you see this not, with, not just with glomalin, but with a number of other glycoproteins across the fungal kingdom. That they'll, they'll do this thing where like, where their body ends and where it begins is a little bit confusing. They'll secrete enzymes into the environment and then take them back up. Um, so I was a little long-winded, I guess, to answer your question again. Uh, ultimately, we don't necessarily know what like the biggest, most important adaptive significance of glomalin was, um, but we can theorize some things that it it maintains structure and it helps nutrient transport. It does all of this stuff. Um, what was the the critical feature that allowed it to evolve in the first place is um, something you could do research on. Yeah. Did you place glomalin into like sandy soil to make it? Um, yeah, but it's it's a living compound, right? Like, you would want the soil to be populated by glomeromycota that would then produce it in, like, despite what this image indicates, that you can just remove glomalin from the soil and then you have this, like, nice glycoprotein pile. That's not how it works. Um, it's, it's basically impossible to separate it from everything else that it is a part of, uh, which, again, is kind of an aesthetic theme that we have going here at glomeromycota. They're, they're not separable from their environment in any meaningful way.